think about the exhibition also in, in, in digital terms. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 the exhibition that we're presenting this semester on, on Moses Mendelssohn started out as a digital project. I started by annotating uh, this image online on Twitter. There, here it goes. And uh, one of the, the main topics was to try and think about what was happening to the books on the bookshelf in the, in the, in the background of the scene, of the room. What books would be there? And so it, it's wonderful to think about books physical in, the, in, in painted form and in digital form with Red Couch Fiber. And Red has been uh, pioneering a platform to distribute and, and, and distribute knowledge about classical Jewish, especially Hebrew texts and commentaries from Sepharia. It's, a, it's both a local enterprise and a global one. It, Red is based in the Bay Area, but it's, it's an enterprise that involves people across several continents. And so we're going to learn from Red how the interface works and how the interface interfaces with what we're doing here. So welcome. Thank you. And thank you for joining us in this project. Good, thank you. Red Hulk, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think this is a very interesting format. I'm really excited to the idea that we start with a painting and then we try to interact with that as a platform for asking questions about other projects. And so my project as Safari is not in the realm of physical painting. I don't really know that much about this image that you see here. It is hanging just in the next room, by the way. So if you haven't seen it, you should make sure you can go see it. Um, but I found it interesting, just looking at this painting already, to ask these questions, to look at this and say, OK, what, what does this teach us about what a library is, what a library should be, what a library was? These are all questions that we ask and think about a lot at Safaria. Yeah. Um, so I'm based in San Francisco. Safari was born in San Francisco, but we now have a team of about a dozen plus people in about eight different cities. And um, we are working on the project of building the library of Jewish texts of the future. So it's, it's a big, bold project. We want to make all Jewish texts available for free in their original, in translation. We want them to be digital, structured, searchable. We want to be able to make possible new kinds of engagements with the text, new ways of interacting with, commenting on, discussing, playing games with. We don't even know what's coming. We want to build the infrastructure that makes all of that, that next step possible. So looking back at the library of the past is actually very fertile. It gives us a lot of room to ask questions and think about what is this project? What goals should it be accomplishing? You know, what things are fundamentally new with new technology and what things are actually very old and maybe we just need a different take on an older dynamic. Um, so in brief, I'm, uh, I live in San Francisco, I mentioned, I um, went to school at Stanford for a program called Symbolic Systems, which was some computer science, some linguistics, and some philosophy. Started work at Google as a product manager, worked on the Google News archives for a while where we collected a few hundred million historical news, uh, paper, and magazine articles, and launched them in a free, searchable format. So I definitely got my training in thinking about technology projects, you know, consumer-facing, user-facing, usable technology projects. I got my training on that at Google. They definitely have some Kool-Aid that they offer you to drink on that front. Um, some of the Kool-Aid is, you know, this basic idea that access to information is inherently empowering. You know, that's not, some people might disagree with that. Um, we don't at Safari and more generally. We, we, we believe that more access to more texts, getting, being able to step into the Talmud faster and easier in your language is a good thing. You might be scared about it for this reason or that, which we can discuss, but that's on the whole part of the Google Kool-Aid that we're pushing forward. Um, some of the other things that I learned that, were, that we're working on now at Safari is to try to tackle big projects. Um, when we first, my co-founder is a guy named Josh Four. when he and I first started talking about this idea and presenting it to other people, we just got a lot of skepticism. People were like, all of Torah? You mean all the Talmud and all the commentary? Isn't that too much? Isn't there, aren't there too many publishers and the copyright? Like, I could understand if you wanted to build an app that was just for the five books of Moses, but all of it, really? Um, that's, this is also part of the, I think, the Google mindset, right, is that if, if a project doesn't have an ambitious, and, and, and you know, sometimes unbelievably ambitious scope, um, then maybe it's not worth working on at all. So that was part of our idea here, too, is to take on a big scope of all of the text and all of the tradition. 
Uh, so that's what we're doing now. Like I said, I've got a team of about 13 people in eight different cities. It's run by Annie, one of my great colleagues, who's the only other Californian on the team. We have a lot more people in Jerusalem and New York, a lot of other cities. Um, so that's by way of introduction to Safaria, and now I want to jump into this painting. Um, and what I want to do is open it up to some of you guys a little bit. Let's, let's just take some time to look at it and think, like, what are the clues here? What are we seeing? What does this represent? What are the things that we think are obviously a part of the library? And what are the things that might be a little bit surprising? Um, I mean, first off, I should say, this, we're, we're taking for granted that this is a picture of a library. Um, a, a library is a, you know, there's no fixed definition of what that is. It's a historical practice and function that's had lots of different shapes over time. Let's take for granted that this is Moses Mendelssohn's library. That's what the title of the event says. What's going on? What do you guys see in this painting that tells us something about this library or libraries in general? Yeah? Well, it's a home. It's, it's a not home. a public building or an office. Right. Okay, so there, there may be a distinction between the Library of Congress, a uh, university library, and a personal library. Right? The personal library is in your home. You have it. It's what you can go to immediately to get things. But maybe there's a corollary to that, too. Like, What's the difference between a personal library and the Library of Congress? Size. Size? Right, like, so there's, okay, there's one large shelf of books here. There's probably, I don't know, about 120 books on that shelf right there. Library of Congress has a lot more. Wouldn't fit in this room. What else? What do we see? Distinguishing between the public library and the personal library, you 
probably wouldn't expect to see chess sets in the Library of Congress or in a, a you know, public institution. But this space is different. This is a social space where people are drinking coffee, reading books, talking to one another, and also playing games. Say something, and you're gonna have to run out the door very quickly. 
I mean, he looks calm in his face, though, also, right? Maybe it's just like he's on the edge of his seat. He's so excited to present his philosophy book to Mendelssohn. And, Who brings you coffee? But again, we hope that 
maybe it's the woman sitting at the table talking philosophy and her husband bringing her the coffee. That's something that could happen today that wasn't going to happen then. Right? Yeah. Um, the library name and drops can be anywhere. Yep. 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 So I'll start showing you a little bit about Safari and what our library currently looks like, but it's a pretty expansive library of Jewish texts getting bigger. It's on your phone. We're working on the app. It'll be out soon. So the entire thing is about 200 megabytes, which means it's tiny as far as your phone and a thumb drive is concerned. It's several times more book than are depicted on the shelf here, and it goes with you everywhere. Yeah. You know, I think the thing about how often I like will be writing something or reading something that's like have to do with my work in the shorts and the t-shirts, you know? Mm -hmm. and, like, all my, you know, really, like, they, you have to show up at this space with some degree of decorum, and right. sort of baby grass or library, like, you know, intellectual spaces are public spaces. Yeah. Whereas now, like, I, I can, I don't have to prepare myself to be interacting with right. information or with other people. Yep. Yeah, I had not thought about that at all. These guys are all remarkably well dressed. Uh, this is this is probably you know, this is a personal space, but I guess at this time they felt that they still needed to get dressed up to entertain company in their library. Maybe today socially there's not as much of that, and certainly if you don't have to go out to the library, but you just have to take out your phone, then shorts and a t-shirt, no problem. Jewish tradition 
it does have this feature we just discussed about being distributed and asynchronous, right? There is a conversation that has taken place in Jewish text over the last several thousand years. Um, it has not taken place in any one place. It started off, you know, in the land of Israel, moved to Babylon, it spread to North Africa and Europe and China and America. It does not happen at one time. You open up a page of the Talmud, you'll see the Talmud in the center with Rashi and Tosafot on the side, you know, chiming in from a different millennia. Even inside the text of the Talmud, you have different rabbis who are quoted who didn't live at the same time. They're commenting on the Mishnah, which is something that came before. So this sense of the interconnectedness of all of our texts is really is just a feature of the way the textual tradition works. Um, Sepharia is all about trying to make that feature as clearly visible and useful to the most number of people as possible, so that you don't have to uh, spend a lifetime learning every single text in order to get a picture in your head about what these connections look like. We want to make it easy for anyone. If you're curious about one line as a starting point, that can be a jumping off point into this world of connections. So let's do that. This is Deuteronomy 28.6. Um, so I'm going to start showing you uh, what is the new design. This is a soon-to-be-launched Safari. If you guys are familiar with Safari already, this, this, this looks different. I believe a lot better. We're very excited to launch this because we've been working on fundamentally redesigning the app from the ground up, learning from the first two years of having launched the site. It's really the prototype that got bigger and bigger, which really became a bloated prototype in technology terms. Now we're starting fresh. Uh, we've been working with the usability, a user experience designer in Brooklyn to really get this thing right this time. So it's close to ready, not quite ready. I'm showing it to you now. If you go on the site, it won't look as good, but uh, stay tuned for this to actually be launched. Uh, so let's just say, we, we know already that we want to look up Deuteronomy 28.6, is that right? Make sure this works. Deuteronomy. So, here's the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and then down to 6. So here it is. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in. I don't know about that. Looks like we both used the 1917 JPS translation, which is the only complete Jewish translation in the public domain. We're working on expanding the options. Hopefully we can lose on that soon. Um, so here's the new safari. This is the text of the site. Uh, you know, we're able to quickly jump in and out of the Hebrew and the English, choose different layouts we might want to look at. Um, but the interesting stuff happens when you click on any line in safari. So if I want to click on a particular text, here I can get to see, you can sort of get at a menu of what are the connections, what are the commentaries that we know about related to this text? So the first off, we are sort of privileging the classical commentaries right now, so Rashi tends to get a privileged position. So what does Rashi say about this? He says, this means, may thy departure from this world be as sinless as thy coming into the world. So what does that have to do with libraries? <laughs> right, like I go into a library fresh and clean, might I get polluted in my time there? Might there be something that I do or experience that actually, I don't know, leaves me with a bad taste in my mouth about learning a Jewish text? I hope not. Hope, we might say that Rashi's gloss on the library, right, is that we hope that when you go into the Beit Midrash, and when you come out of the Beit Midrash, you still feel good about everything going on. That's one voice, Rashi. Ibn Ezra also has things to say. We don't have his text translated yet. These are all the different classical commentaries that I can kind of click through to look around. Um, but we have more than commentaries too. We also have quotations and interconnections. So you know, it turns out that the Guide for the Perplexed has quoted this line of text. And this is where we see that in the Guide for the Perplexed. Um, in the Kabbalah, it comes up in the Zohar. We have a Midrash that's about this particular text, or at least that quotes this particular text, um, as well as source sheets. So if you have been on our site before, one of our most popular features for educators is the ability to create source sheets, create a resource for your student that picks and chooses little bits of primary sources, adds in your own commentary, your own questions, boom, you've got something to give to help your students learn. And so these are three of our contemporary users. Um, I don't know any of them, but the three of them have all made source sheets that include this verse of text. So it may 
be that we can jump into one of those source sheets and find some other related text or a comment that's worth looking at over there. Um, so one of the things, when, as we've been redesigning the site, um, the user experience designer we have uh, does, is not a Torah scholar. We were looking for the, a great UX designer who is also a great Torah scholar. Hard to fill, uh, both of those two things intersecting. We found someone who is interested in Torah and is a great user experience designer, and now our whole team has to work with him to make sure he understands the dynamics of our users, of the learners, of the tradition. It's been very educational for him as well as us. Um, one of the ideas he had was in, in treating this whole process a little bit anthropologically and thinking like, okay, what is this Beit Midrash? What is Torah study? How do I even get my head around what this activity is? So one of the techniques that he had was to um, do a Google image search for Beit Midrash. And he collected a whole series of images of people in the Beit Midrash and sort of did a study about what are they doing? What are they physically like? How are they sitting? How are they posturing? What objects are around them? How many people? What are the expressions on their faces like? Just like really looking as though you had totally fresh eyes, what happened in the baby drush? Um, so one of the things that came very clear early on was that typically in the baby drush, people are sitting in pairs or more with books open in front of them. But you almost never see what we saw in the painting. In the painting, there was one book open in front of the people. Uh, sitting down around it. In the big midrash, in these photos that Gabe, our designer, was looking at, you tended always to see one book open over here, with another book open closely adjacent to it, that's slightly out of reach, and then a pile of books over here. It's usually four books that are slightly out of reach. Those are closed, but they're nearby. There's never a book alone. Uh, there probably are. There are lots of cases where you can't get books alone. Although, in fairness, in the big midrash, any book that you open is probably not alone already, right? Like, the, you open a page, a book of Talmud, there's already 30 different voices represented on each page of the text. So even if it's one book, it's sort of not. But in any case, it got us thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we accommodate this? Our, our users want to have this multi-textual experience with multiple books open side by side. What can we build that lets them do that in the way that they like? Um, so that's something we've been working on in this new design, too. So. This is similar to the current Safari that you sort of have a primary text and a sidebar. Um, but one of the things that's different, if we go to the Midrash, because those are always nice, is that um, on something in the sidebar, to open it up as a full text unto itself. So it's no longer this asymmetry of you know, something's primary and the other thing is secondary. Now we just have two books open side by side together. And they can have some independence, so I can set this one to be in, in, in Hebrew, and I can you know, change the font size of this, each of them is a little bit different. Um, and similarly, when I find a quotation in a text, you can click any quotation to open it up as its own book, side by side. So, I'll just put this in English, it's easier. Sometimes, so it's like now we're seeing, and, oh, sorry, I just clicked on the same thing, so it's probably not interesting. Let's click on something different. So here's another line in the midbar about this one. So now what we're seeing is, I, we started here. Well, we started the painting. The painting led us to a citation. The citation led us to this text on Safaria, which in turn we found was quoted in this uh, midrash. And this midrash is not only quoting this text, it's also quoting another one from Numbers. Now we can open all of those out side by side, and if there's some critical thinking we need to apply to the relationship, maybe we can figure it out. I have no idea what this particular set of text means at all. I just clicked randomly to open them. But that's sort of the point, is that we want it to be so easy to dive into these texts that you can just click, 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 and open things up. Um, there's this effect on Wikipedia called, it's called the Wikipedia effect. I'm sure you guys have experienced it if you haven't heard about it, which is you open an article on you know, rockets and then you click on the thing about jet propulsion. And from there, you're at this scientist who invented it. And he happens to be married to a woman that was involved in English literature. And it's like two hours later, you've taken this random tour across human culture. But you, you were sucked in, right? You didn't notice those two hours go by. You just click, click, click. That's, that's the Wikipedia effect. We do want to recreate this effect for Torah. We want to make it possible that you start at this week's Parsha and then two hours later, you've gone through Rashi and Midrash and Talmud and Kabbalah. Who even knows where, where these paths can take you? Um, I do want to show you, you know, what
what some of these pads look like, too. Uh, we have in our library currently about uh, 60 million words of text across Hebrew and English. Um, that's, I keep remembering the numbers here, I mean, there's probably about 700 books worth of content that's digitized and interconnected. We also have about 700,000 links that we've identified intertextually, where we know that this text quotes that one, or comments on that one, or is an allusion to this one. So this is a visualization of just two slices of, really one slice of those connections between the Tanakh, the, the, the Jewish Bible, and the Talmud, the Talmud Bavli on the bottom. So each of these little blocks represents a book. Here's the book of Genesis up here. This is the book of Psalms. Down at the bottom, this is Baal Kama, you know, other books down there. We've got about 30,000 uh, places where we've been able to identify that the Talmud explicitly quotes Tanakh. Um, and those are all here. There's a line for each of them visualized on this page right now. And it's dynamic, too. So I can hover over and see, like, okay, between Genesis and Sanhedrin, 155 connections. Maybe I'm only interested in Genesis. Like, what parts of Genesis get quoted and where? So this is zooming into Genesis, but still over the whole Talmud. You know, maybe I want to filter down here, too, right? So between Genesis and Brachot, this is the pattern of actual connections that you're seeing, you know, chapter by chapter, dot by dot. Um, it's fascinating to look at, I and mean, fascinating just because this is an image that, um, you know, one of our engineers led in Jerusalem, he coded this up because he was really curious what it would look like. So it looks like this. Who, who made this image, really, though? Like, who is actually the author of this graph? It wasn't Lev. Lev built the software that visualized it from our data set. But this network pre-existed. It predated, you know, us and our computers and everything. This was actually in the, the shape of the text itself. We think that's fascinating. We think we have now tools to be able to visualize that and explore that better than we could before. So you can actually see some interesting patterns coming out of here. One of the examples I like to show uh, is if you go to the book of Esther on top. So first off, something clearly is going on here. Right? This is not a random set of lines. Any guesses what's going on here? Book of Esther on top. Yeah. It's one track of the Talmud. This one, of course, is tracked to Megillah. That is ostensibly all about the Book of Esther. It's about reading the Book of Esther on on Purim and more. So if we zoom in there though, we see a second thing. Oops, I think I clicked into the text. So again, we can jump into the text. That's great. Let me get back to where I was. Uh, so, back to Esther on the top, Megillah on the bottom. So there's another interesting pattern that we see that emerges, and uh, I have not personally learned all of Tractate Megillah myself, but our director of education in Chicago is a woman named Sarah Walkenfeld. She was learning Megillah with her students at the time that we brought this out. And they looked at this diagram and they all like, had this knowing smile, They're like, aha, yes, we all know that about page was it page 22, page 23 of Tractate Megillah is when the book that's all about the book of Esther stops caring about the book of Esther. All of the quotations between Megillah and Esther happen up into a point, and then the last quarter of the book doesn't reference the book of Esther a single time. It goes off on other tangents. It has other things to concern itself with. And you can see that visually here. Um, there are all sorts of patterns that can emerge out of this text. Um, let me show you one other quick visualization. This is a visualization of our entire library. All of the words of text that we have in the library. This is called a sunburst chart, where each ring that comes out from the center represents the same quantity of words, but in finer and finer granularity in terms of how they're categorized. So the center, this is just everything. One big blue mass, almost 60 million words. Then the next ring out is the high level category. So this is Tanakh. Over here is Mishnah. Talmud, Midrash, Halakha, on and on. So you can see specifically how many words of text we have in each of these categories. And we're not, we're not done. We're working through a, a roadmap that covers about 150 million words of text that are you know, what we have kind of, are thinking of as the most commonly studied classical Jewish text. Like kind of the core of the core is what we're currently working on scanning, digitizing, importing into the structure, linking together, 
Um, so we're not done. We still have a, a long ways to go, even to the point where we think we've just got the basic canon of Jewish text. But this is a great start. And this great start also can show you sort of what the high-level important categories are, right? Tanakh is a giant category. Talmud is a bigger category. Talmud is much bigger than the Tanakh, and the number of commentaries on that are much, much bigger. Um, as we go out from here, we get more fine-grained categories within. So we actually, when we say Tanakh here, we're considering the actual text of the Bible itself and the Tanakh commentary. So that's fascinating also, just off the bat, right? Like, look, look here, this is Torah. This little blue sliver, I uh, can barely get my mouth over, is all Torah. The Torah is about 80,000 words of text. It's the foundation for everything here. Everything here draws its authority and connects back to that teeny tiny blue sliver. But by quantity, it's really not that much. And by quantity, if you look at the number of Torah commentaries that we have, we have easily 10 times the number of words in commentary as in the base text. That applies in Talmud too, right? So this, I said with all Talmud, well actually, this is the Bavli. The Bavli is actually about 1.8 million words. This is counting currently in English and Hebrew, but... Why? Why what? Why is it counting both? Why is it counting both? Oh, because that's, I loaded it in the complete library mode, so let me click to Hebrew only. So now we're just looking at the Hebrew text as soon as this loads. Um, it's, the other way is helpful for understanding what we have. Looking at the Hebrew text is more helpful for understanding what is actually out there, but we're also still in progress, so things aren't necessarily done. Hopefully this will load in a minute. Um, but the same pattern applies, right? The Bavli is about 1.8 million words. The number of commentaries that we have on the Bavli, though, is already 13 million words. And again, we we're sort of feel like we're just scratching the surface in terms of text that we want to bring in. Um, so this is sort of a, you know, a picture of the scale of the kind of project that we're working on. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'd love to hear any questions that you might have about the painting or the website. Yeah. So why is it why are you quantifying words per se instead of rows and text? Why are you interested in quantifying words? Words yeah. rather than uh, why is this your biography rather than yeah. the statue of one and two? Yep. Is there an actual interpretation of the way you're other than quantification? Mm -hmm. Because that can obviously be divided by the two. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so first off, there is definitely a problem in counting things in general, that you tend to count things that are easy to count and easy to quantify, and you have a harder time quantifying things that are hard to quantify, right? So words are easy. We can very easily create a clear metric of how many words we have in the library. It carries across everything, no matter if it's an Aramaic text or a Hebrew text, if it's late early, it's a denominator, right, that we can use. It's neutral, it's not perfect, it doesn't represent what we care about perfectly, uh, but it's usable, it's useful, it's something. You know, honestly, in this case, it's really like, there existed this uh, tool set of a library for building visualizations inside of a web page. We thought it was really fun, we wanted to play with it. Our data fits nicely into it, so we sort of thought, what data can we feed into these tools to, to develop something? Um, I mean, it, 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 it is a problem for us, actually. We, we, inside our team, we end up having to ask the question of, do we need, are we still trying to optimize for the number of words we're adding to the site, or do we also need to be optimizing, for example, uh, interconnectivity, like the number of links that we have to a, to a text. When we bring in a new book, if it has zero links, it's much less interesting than if it has a lot of links. Similarly, at the point, at the stage of development we're at right now, you might make the argument that it's more useful if we could add interconnections between some of the primary texts that we already have, rather than going after some new book that's just not as studied. Um, so those are real tensions we have to deal with in the way that we prioritize the text. But generally, though, the list of texts that we're working on is prioritized. There is some sense that we've made a list and we've evaluated it for how frequently studied are these texts so that we're trying to put in the ones that will get the most usage first. Uh, yeah, so it's a communications issue we need to keep on top of. I mean, basically, the, the, the real message here is this is still a work in progress. We've come a long way, uh, but we still have a long way to go, and there are definitely questions we haven't answered yet. And then all the sites have to be published in commentaries, or not? Yeah, so we are a free culture project. Part of our big mission is to make this stuff reusable for the most number of people 
educators, scholars, developers, right? We think about the, the college kid in their dorm room who will build the next app. We want it to be easy. So the texts generally are in the public domain in their original, although that's not always the case. Um, generally, we're getting them from other sources or scanning and digitizing them ourselves. Translations, we always try to get things into the public domain or into the creative commons when they're still uh, under copyright today. So there are lots of different ways that we're dealing with that. The one that we are sort of the most excited about right now is working with publishers to actually make a deal where we raise the money to cut them a big check so they will set their text free. And we had our first big deal with Urim Publications where we were able to liberate four complete Torah commentaries in English. The deal was unprecedented as far as we know in its structure. We paid them money that we raised we did not acquire the IP. We did not acquire the copyright to that text. They kept it. We just told them that they had to release the text with a Creative Commons license. So they still own it, they can do what they do, but also we can put it up on our website, our users can download it, our users can build a new iPhone app using that. It's effectively in the public domain right now. So that's, I'd say it's kind of our favorite approach right now is to be able to use our strength at fundraising to liberate and pay the ransom on these copyrighted texts. Uh, but we also have crowdsourcing. We also have users who come to the site and add new translations on the site. And when that happens, it's, you know, our terms of service say, you agree that this goes into the world with a Creative Commons Zero license, which it basically says it's in the public domain. If you're doing it on our site, you want it to be used as openly as possible. So you edit that? The user edits that? Stuff. That a user contributed translations. Yeah. Not all of them. Depends on the project. When we run specific projects, like we had a campaign to translate the entire Mishnah, we had a campaign to translate uh, Ibn Ezra, a part of Shulchan Aruch. Uh, in those cases, we treated the complete text of the first draft, and then we had a team of educators, rabbis, scholars who reviewed and edited for for content mistakes and for consistency in style. We have some staff that is reviewing user-submitted translations ongoing in general, uh, but not always. We do allow, as soon as someone writes a translation, it is up and on Safari immediately. Um, it's clearly indicated, it's not yet in the new site, but the old site will say, has it been reviewed? Who reviewed it? How many people reviewed it? If it hasn't been reviewed, who added it? Who edited it? You can click on each of their profiles, you can see who is this person, do I trust them or not? So, um, you know, it's also it's part of the way that we operate, that we, we would rather throw things out into the world sooner so that we can get things moving and get feedback and get excitement around what we're doing rather than hold them back until we know that they're absolutely perfect. It's just not how we operate as a sort of startup. Um, but it's a real question we do have to deal with. Yeah, and it's a, it has been sort of the, the single biggest critique of the whole project is just that. It is who, who, who wrote this translation and how do you know that it's any good? So that's why in some ways we're really shifting more to focus on publishers and professional translators. Um, but it's it's a vast field. We'll take any we'll do whatever we can. You know, different texts and different projects take different approaches. So we'll, we're, we're willing to use all the tools that we can find. commentaries on this land, right? So this is what Rashi says on this piece of numbers. Then I can open up from there, and it can go on and on forever. It gets really ugly, as you can see, very quickly. So this is part of the design work, is still to figure out, like, where does this end, right? Maybe on this screen, probably three panels is about as much as you could want. If you had a giant screen or you were projecting onto a museum wall, maybe you want 40 texts, and uh, we could do that. Uh, but, but yeah, this is not usable, right? commentary and the text that it comments on. 
So we, we import Rashi on Torah. The way Rashi on Torah is structured, we can draw those lines. We see where those connections draw just from the structure of the text. So we have a, a large chunk of those connections are between commentaries and their texts. The second case is for uh, quotation. So if one text explicitly cites another text, and it happens to include in, in the text itself a written out citation of where it comes from, we can pull that out automatically. Our software is, is really built all around citations. In some ways, citations are the core the heart of Safari understanding how they work and working with them. So our code understands them automatically. So if we see them in a text that we import, we draw those lines automatically. And so the, the uh, Talmud, Tanakh maps that I showed you, I mean, really, we can't take credit for the, the actual scholarly work there. We imported a version of the text from Wikisource that already included inline citations. So in the process of importing that text, we sort of got 30,000 new connections sort of for free. Uh, so that, those are the two biggest categories. There's another category that comes from our staff members. It's kind of a mix between scholarly and technical, just like trying to come up with an algorithm, come up with a program that can figure out how does this book relate to this other book. And so our team is doing that just sort of on an operational basis all the time. And then there is the crowdsource side. There is people who just manually, like they think of a connection between this and that, they can come to the site and type it in and draw that line. That does happen, but in terms of quantity, it's not, not as large as the other groups right now.